Okay, so how many of you guys here are uh, first time startup grinders? I get a show of hands? Wow, so most of you. All right, well, you guys checked out the website. Uh, we are a global community of you guys. You know, we're a global community of uh, entrepreneurs, investors, founders, and uh, just kind of the movers and the shakers, the people that kind of change the world because they, they're crazy enough to think they can. Um, and, you know, tonight we have one of those uh, exact types of people, um, like Greg said, uh, or like, uh, you know, like James said, uh, you know, Greg is everywhere in the news, and for good reason. He's, he's one of the big reasons why Baltimore is up and coming as a tech hub and as a startup hub. So, um, you know, if, uh, if Greg would like to uh, introduce himself, uh, you know, tell, you a little, tell yourself a little bit more. Do you want to stand up? or What do you uh, think? There's, 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 no, yeah, there's no formula to this. You guys want us to sit or stand? Sit. Okay, he wants us to sit, so we're going to sit. It'd be weird standing <laughs> behind a chair, you know? I mean, I could stand behind the chair. Could everyone hear me okay? All right, cool. So, you just want me to introduce myself? Yeah, so the, the way these work is um, usually we're going we're gonna to do our fireside chat. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about Greg, what he's up to. Uh, we're going to learn about some of his, uh, his stories, his trials, and his tribulations, and also you know, just some timeless uh, Greg pieces of tidbits of information that you might be able to apply somewhere in your, in your life and uh, you know, find some success. Uh, well, um, that being said, you know, uh, in terms of in terms of your life, Greg, you know, yeah. we don't have to start all the way at the beginning sure. and get the entire life story, but um, you know, what were some key instrumental moments I can, that I led can to where you're at? It. I can cliff note it for you a little okay. bit. So, um, hi, I'm Greg, and uh, I've been in Baltimore since 1992. I came here to go to UMBC. I'm from New Jersey, born in New York City, um, and I'm an entrepreneur, first and foremost. Um, I'm also uh, an early stage investor, uh, an ecosystem builder. Um, and currently the CEO of a company called Mission Tix um, right here in Baltimore. We're an online provider of ticketing uh, software for event uh, producers. Um, so how many people in the room have heard of Mission Tix? Just curious. Okay, cool. We're a 13-year-old startup. It's awesome. Um, I, um, when I got here, um, I came to, um, well, first of all, just, just to put the entrepreneur bug in my ear, a uh, little known fact. Um, one of the things that kind of put the bug in my ear was, was two things. First of all was, um, growing up, my father always had a subscription to Entrepreneur Magazine. He was on Wall Street for 30 years, um, was a municipal bond trader, and I, I don't think he ever realized that um, I was the only one in the house, I think, that actually read the magazine every single month that it came. And back then, Entrepreneur Magazine was mainly just franchise ads, you know? Jiffy Lubes and you know car washes and you know how to fix windshields and that kind of stuff, but I read the I read all the the editorial in it and I think like early on go, growing up it kind of put the bug in my ear of like you know being my own like pay, marching to the beat of my own drum paving my own way in life and um, and that it's funny because that's eventually what I wound up doing. Um, what people don't know about me as well is that um, when I was growing up in New Jersey along the Jersey Shore, when I was 16, I was an emergency medical technician, and I was actually a volunteer first, aid, first aider. So when I was 16, I was a cadet. And through 16, through 18, 19, two, three years of doing that, I thought that's what I wanted to be. I think I was attracted to like the adrenaline, being the first responder, being on the scene, um, and that energy. And it turned out that I, you know, by the time I was 18, I had seen a lot of stuff in life that was pretty, pretty actually horrible, actually, in, in, in terms of like you know different scenarios from accidents to people dying. But I thought that's what I wanted to do, and that's how actually that's what actually brought me here to Baltimore. Um, I was looking at different universities that had EMS programs, emergency medical service programs, and it turns out if you don't know that UMBC has one of the best ones in the country. Uh, among many other things. And so I came to Maryland, in Baltimore specifically, to pursue that, that vision. And I got about halfway through the program and I had one of those things like, you know, a moment of clarity. Like I was just like, wait a second. You know, I was, I was volunteering on the Arbutus First Aid Squad. Um, I was going on calls. I was training to be a paramedic, training to be an administrative, um, you know, person. And in, in we, we have an amazing healthcare system here in Baltimore. And I just realized that's not what I wanted to do at all. Because when I went to college at university, uh, UMBC, um, I was always involved in the um, student events board. I was the, the university's tech crew manager, so all this kind of stuff with video and audio and lights for any event. Um, and so I, I developed this passion for live events, which is funny now that I'm the CEO of Mission Ticks. It's come for full circle. 
But as I got halfway through my, my college career, um, I decided that I was going to switch, um, switch careers totally and pivot my degree into English. And it was an interesting switch to go from EMS to English, but I did it based on the one simple theory that no matter what I did in my life, I was going to have to be able to read and write and communicate really well. And it turned out that that's served me pretty well um, in my life so far. Um, and then uh, grow, getting out of school, um, I, the first thing I did was uh, most people go out, they look for jobs, that kind of stuff. I just loved the event business so much that I started my first company right out of UMBC. It was called Missing Link Media. And I was a concert promoter. So I put on shows all over town, everything from the old Wrecker Theater to Lithuanian Hall in Sawebo to the 8x10 to UMBC's Fieldhouse to you name it. Um, I was an unfunded, bootstrapped um, concert promoter who had no business doing what I was doing at all. And, and I learned a lot about um, how to develop tough skin. I often say that it wasn't, it wasn't often that I, I didn't have the most, I had the most expensive concert ticket in the audience because I was the one taking the risk on the bands to come in. And oddly enough, it was really cool to do that job at, at such an early age right out of college because, like I said, it developed thick skin and it taught me how to take risks, right? It taught me how to like, you know, put myself on the line and know that if it was going to happen and it was going to be successful, there was only one person that was going to make it successful, and that was me. And that's that whole sort of self-reliance thing we were talking about earlier. Um, you want me to keep riffing? No, no, no. Um, yeah, and I, I feel like a lot of, uh, you know, how many, how many of you guys in this room are, are founders or have started businesses or currently starting businesses? Okay. So a lot of you guys can attest to kind of what Greg is saying in terms of, uh, you know, taking those risks. Uh, it's a huge roll of the dice, and you never know if you're going to be successful, and, and odds are typically against you, right? Um, so I completely understand that. Uh, and by the way, that was a failure for me. I mean, I, you know, you start up and, and you start things, and you do them, and, and I, I look back and I, I consider that business a failure because I had no capital. I was, it was in the middle of when the concert industry was being rolled up by, yeah. um, you know, Clear Channel and SFX and all those companies that ultimately eventually became Live Nation. I had just like an independent promoter with no cash. I had no business, so I had to partner up, and eventually. You know, I would say it was a good failure because, you know, it was so many late nights, so many like long hours, so much hustle. Oh, that was the other thing. That, was, that, that business taught me like the art of hustle. And anybody who's a founder of a company knows that if you're going to make, move the needle at all, you got to have your hustle, right? And so I was the guy putting flyers out, putting my windshields, paying other people to distribute them. You know, building was actually the first. That was actually my first um, experience with building websites and building an email list and getting marketing going. Right, so I learned that hustle of, of getting it done. But eventually, it's just you know, you got to know when to call it. Right, I mean, you know, you make money one day, lose it the next. Make money one day, lose it the next, and eventually gets kind of gets kind of old. So that being said, I want to kind of uh, ask Greg about uh, you know, Greg, what uh, what led you to create your first true startup that that became a success. Blue Sky Factory. Yep. Um, what led to that? Uh, let's see. So I was working at the Emerging Technology Center in Canton at the time when it was in Canton. It was 1999, and um, I was working for a company called Zero to Eighty, which is one of the first tenants in there. I was a second employee. Um, real heady time. So basically, what happened was I took the um, concert promoting company got out of the concert business, used the same entity to start building small business websites, was being mentored by this guy named Steve Crawford who had this company zero to 80. We were like the hot stuff back in the day. We had the mountain, you know, we had the rock climbing wall in the office and it was just crazy. You know, we were always on the tours when the mayor's office was coming through. In fact, Mary, I remember that? You guys were doing the tech tours. You guys would come by back in the day. Um, and so, anyway, that was that was what led me to led me to ultimately start Blue Sky. Was I was the second employee there. It was me and this designer. And um, well, I'm sorry, actually, before I got there, so Steve was so Steve was mentoring me with that concert promoting firm that I had turned into a web development firm. And he was teaching me how to basically. I think ultimately he realized he was grooming a competitor, and he he realized that I kind of could put one plus one equals two together. And he said, "Why don't you just come work for me?" So this was almost three years out of school and had never had a job before, you know, just was doing this hustle thing with a concert promoting thing. And so I was like, you know what, I could get used to a steady paycheck for the first time in my life. So I, I took the job at zero to 80. Um, it was a second employee. It was me and this guy, Trevor. Trevor was a graphic designer. And um, 
the, the company grew so fast because it was back in the day when you could go out and sell what would probably be now a $50,000 website project for $300,000 because the clients didn't know what they were buying and the people who were doing the work didn't even really know what they were doing. And that was definitely what zero to 80 was doing. So we, I'll never forget, you know, Steve came back to the office one day, he's like, so it got a contract on a $300,000 website. It was like getting a big check from an early stage VC or an angel. And um, next thing you know, like within six months, we were like 25 people. We had, you know, art, we had, we had a, um, you know, designers, developers, we had office manager, we had just a CTO, the whole nine yards. It grew so fast, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. And I didn't really have, I was just jumping around from like thing to thing and it was, it was really interesting because I was hiring people, I was project managing, I was doing sales, I was doing finance, I was art directing, I was managing software developers. And I mean, I just told you where I came from so I had no experience at all, which turned out to be really good uh, for me. And so what had happened was, was as the company kind of like life cycle went on, we, we started selling this product uh, with a partner company called TMX Interactive, which did rich media email. So back in the day, back in the day, you could actually like stream flash and movie into an inbox, uh, an email inbox client before spam and security really, you know, was a big, was a big deal. And so I was fascinated with that and the company started taking a hard left and went into some debt and it was your classic, you know, dot com bomb scenario where there was not a lot of money we were, and Steve came in and told everybody we're going to skip a payroll, which was not uncommon those days. And we skipped the payroll and I realized that, you know, I was owed like $25,000 in sales commissions. I knew I'd never see that. I was, was kind of getting tired of the company anyway, but the bigger, the bigger thing was, was that TMX was recruiting me out of um, zero to 80 to become their regional business development manager. And they threw this crazy, crazy base salary at me and they threw me options and equity and the whole nine yards. So I quit the job knowing I had that safety net and it turns out a couple other people quit as well, one of them being my co-founder, Richard, the same day, Richard Cruitt. And so before I decided to take the job, he said, dude, you just like brought in a million dollars of sales for this company and nobody knew what the hell we were doing. Like, why don't you try doing that for yourself? I mean, we can do it together. And so long story short, how I started Blue Sky was, um, I turned down an amazing offer at the age of 26 years old, which would have, like was double what I was making at zero to 80. Um, and turned that down to start Blue Sky Factory in 2001 with no capital in the worst possible time ever with somebody who I had known for just about six months and with no business. That's how we started the company. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Which, by the way, <laughs> turned out to be one of the best decisions of my life. At the time, though, I had no idea. It was one of those forks in the road where you can go the safe route or you can go into the deep, dark unknown. So. That was the risk from the first business that allowed me to make that decision, I think. Yeah, and a, a little known fact that you guys don't, uh, or may not know, unless you've read, uh, read Greg's biography, which I stalked for the last month or so, is, uh, is that you know, he took the company from zero to, you know, how much, I, I don't even know what you exited for, I won't go too much into details, but uh, you know, he built this empire pretty much uh, out of nothing in, in, in about a decade or so. It was 10 years, yeah. um, really cool story. And by the way, Doug Brojuice is in the office, my, my old COO. Say hi, Doug, come on, man. <laughs> Doug, uh, Doug scaled the company up with me there for the last three, four years in the end, actually had a stint in the beginning. So Blue Sky was awesome because Blue Sky was totally bootstrapped. We didn't raise $1 of investment money, which I, didn't, I think it was year eight that I looked back and said, Jesus, man, I can't believe, like, I didn't really appreciate like how, like, how far we had come without investment dollars. And all my other friends who startups had raised money and da da da, da. We, we literally did something like that was novel. We actually like went out, generated revenue and like funded our business by revenue. It's like novel, huh? Like crazy, crazy idea, but that's what we did. We just, we'd make a little, and, and the early days were ugly we didn't make any money for about 18 months, but uh, we were a service-based company that did email marketing, for those of you who don't know the story. And uh, we built some really crappy technology in Cold Fusion. Um, my partner, Richard, did the tech side. I did the business development, marketing, and sales. We went out and we sold to agencies like Weber Shanwick, like TBC, all the ones all the way up here locally and nationally, and did email marketing on behalf of their clients. And um, we just got to a point where 
the service side of the business wasn't going to scale because everybody wanted to hit the send button on their own and we just didn't have a product roadmap and we didn't have a really good technical execution. Um, and so in, 2000, in 2006, um, I bought Richard out of the business and acquired the other 50% of the, of the company myself by putting myself into yet another big decision. Try putting yourself into seven figures of debt and personally guaranteeing guaranteeing it. That was like the next big move. I kind of like take that decision and, and I pivot it back to the one where I decided to start the company. It was like the two big decisions because when you sign that kind of paperwork and you personally guarantee seven figures and you don't have really large cash reserves, you're basically once again betting exclusively on yourself. And that goes back to that self-reliance piece that I talked about earlier. And so I was all in at that point and then from 2006 um, all the way up through 2011, um, Doug, myself, and a another partner, Tim Barton, s turned the company from a service-based company into a SaaS platform, software as a service, and converted all of our clients. But by the time we sold the company, we had we were 90% clients. 90% of our clients were like uh, service-based, project-based. And then we built this awesome product and flipped the entire paradigm around. And we were 90% monthly recurring revenue, 10% project base, roughly, I would say. And, um, and, it, it, and, and we just we scaled. And to your, your question was, I think we got to about 600 customers. Um, and we were doing a little over, we were, we were like a $6 million run rate. But we were extremely profitable because it was software as a service. Um, and so you know, not, not too shabby. And, and the cool little fact about Blue Sky is, um, going to your 10-year comment, I didn't, I, so I signed the letter of intent to sell it. So I, I registered Blue Sky Factory on March 23rd, 2001. I signed the LOI to sign it on March 23rd, 2011. 10 years, literally, <laughs> to, to the day. Not to the definitive agreement, but to actually, you know, make the decision to sell it, which is wild. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, just to kind of go off uh, what you're talking about, Risk, um, usually for these events, we go down uh, kind of a timeline and a structure in terms of the interview. Uh, I think uh, Greg and I agreed that downstairs, you know, we, we take a little bit of a different approach to this uh, just because, you know, who wants structure, right? We're all founders in here, so. We're riffing, um, So what I want to talk about now is, uh, you know, I want to I kind of just go over, you know, what it's like, uh, what was it like, you know, in terms of being an entrepreneur, where were some of the hurdles that you faced in life, and then how were, you know, just more of uh, the story of Greg. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I always explain my journey of entrepreneurship as a, um, you know, it's a journey of self-discovery, right? I mean, it really is. Um, that's the way I look at it, and I think if those of you who are entrepreneurs um, go through the things that entrepreneurs go through, you might discover that it, it is kind of a journey of self-discovery. You learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about what you're made of, you learn about a lot about what makes you tick, you learn a lot about other people, you learn, um, you know, you just learn a lot of different things. And uh, sometimes you learn the easy way, sometimes you learn the hard way. Um, you know, it was very, you know, there, we, there were some very difficult times. Um, obviously, my first company was, was, I had no idea what I was doing, so a lot of mistakes being made. But uh, what I really learned in, in, my, in my tenure at Blue Sky was the value of team and people, which I didn't really understand in the beginning. But as the company matured, I realized that, you know, it's, it's way better. It's a much bigger thing than me. It's, it's, it's much bigger than, in order to do something and do it right, it's about the team that you build and the culture that you build and the people that are, are surrounding, you surround yourself with every day. Um, and it took me a while to learn that lesson. It, it really did. Um, but when I, when, I, when I learned it and I valued it, um, it, it w we got to a better place. Um, and then just going through the exercise of, of, of bootstrapping a company and not having funding and not having you know, a board of directors or, or all the things that so many people are gone to, there was, you know, there was a lot of introspection. You know? Don't get me wrong, I had great people, like I said, around me, but ultimately, in my case, you know, the decision was always mine. So it was, again, going back to that you know, self-introspection. And um, you know, a, a, little, a well-known fact is that uh, Greg is the, the one of the founders of uh, the Baltimore Angels. Uh, you know, can you share with the audience a little bit about when and why you decided to take the leap from uh, founder into investor, kind of sure. looking at it from the other side of the table? Yeah, so the Baltimore Angels has been around since 2009, and um, I co-founded it with a gentleman named Dave Troy and a couple other entrepreneurs and attorney in town named Newt Fowler. And um, it came out of an idea, um, you know, it was after a board meeting that him and I were on, and I, I just said, you know, there seems to be like, because like 
there was no early stage capital in this town five years ago. Like, if anybody can raise their hand and tell me where it was, please do. But there was no early stage capital. And coming from uh, an entrepreneur who didn't even have the option to raise capital in 2001, because the, the, the bubble had just burst, so we started Blue Sky. We just literally started it by going out and selling something and getting that first check and then snowballing from there. And you hear about the Valley and you hear about all these other areas that you know, have early stage financing. I just was also kind of feeling like in 2009, like further and further away from the startup world because my company was growing and it was getting bigger and there was you know, management and layers and stuff like that. I kind of missed the startup and working with entrepreneurs a little bit. So Dave and I was like, you know, there seems to be some really cool ideas in town, but I wonder how these people are getting funded. And I never was really like a, a stock market guy and I had a little bit of money put away and I was trying to figure out what to do with it. So we started the Baltimore Angels and um, really with the, the, the pure intention of, A, obviously we're, we're investors and we like to, you know, invest in good companies and good entrepreneurs, but it was also like a spoke in, in, in the ecosystem that was missing. And we were all passionate about getting early stage financing going in this market so that entrepreneurs who had good ideas had access to capital. And so we started it in 2009 and um, Dave ran it and because I was running Blue Sky, he had just sold his ISP Toadnet. So he was taking the lead with it. We were real scrappy. We used to meet in the ETC in the conference room. There was no dues. Anybody could really show up who wanted to. We'd see five or six pitches. And we started doing like a deal every once in a blue moon like for the first few years. Um, and then it's funny because then our roles sort of switched after I sold Blue Sky. Dave started 410 Labs and he was like, I can't do this anymore. There was a big gap in meetings. So I took over as the managing member in um, November of 2011. And from November of 2011 until like today, which our next meeting is next week, we really ramped up the Baltimore Angels. We put process in place. We did pre-screening. Um, we, we offer mentorship to um, the, the, the community. We also sponsor and get involved in more community development related events. But more importantly, we stroke checks and do deals. Um, and we crossed over $2 million um, in investing capital this year, which we're proud of. Um, doesn't seem like a lot when you look at some of the other areas, but $2 million, bucks, $2 million, bucks, you know. And the Baltimore Angels would invest, you know, typically fifty dollars to $100,000 in deals back in the day. And we did maybe six deals from 2009 through 2011. And then 2012, we did eight deals. In 2013, we did eight deals. So just to give you an idea like, of, of the amount of things that ramped up, and more importantly, we also have been recruiting a really, good, a really interesting group of individuals who are in the group. And it's a combination of like old, school, old Baltimore money, new Baltimore money, current entrepreneurs, exited entrepreneurs, uh, VCs who are looking to get um, into awareness of the early stage, um, Tedco's involved, and it's really, it's really starting to rev up, and, and, and we're really proud of the work that we've done. And you know, for me, the Baltimore Angels is really just about, my only goal with it is to make it sustainable so that it continues on. Okay, good stuff. Uh, Greg's doing a lot of good stuff. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, and this is probably a question that a lot of founders in here have, um, you know, are there, are there any kind of myths that you learned taking that jump from, you know, startup founder to the actual investor? Are there any hurdles that, uh, you know, that invest or that investors look for that startups should be thinking about if they're seeking investment? It's kind of that all encompassing question of, you know, what are, what are the key points that they should focus on? Sure. Um, cause I'm sure a lot of you guys out here are probably, you know, startup founders that are looking for some sort of seed fund. Um, you know, what are, what are the ones especially that you personally would Yeah, it's really about? interesting too, like the way I think about it because I've never raised any money. Like I, I don't know the process of raising, I mean I know the process very well, I just, I've never done it myself. I've never, I've always bootstrapped. I mean even with mission ticks, we're not, we're not funded, you know what I mean? Um, so it's interesting being on the other side of it and doing the investing um, and, and, and the world has changed a lot. and. I would say this to anybody looking to, to, to pitch, you know, even the Baltimore Angels or any angel group, like traction is the new due diligence, really, you know what I mean? And like, you know, unless you're an exited entrepreneur one or two times over and you have an idea, you, you, probably, you probably, you know, won't get funded without traction, you know? And it's just kind of the reality of the situation. Um, the investors want to see like, products that problem solution 
validated that solution, some traction in the market, whether even if it's a pilot program that you, got, that you conducted or you have a certain amount of user base and you're kind of going up and to the right or um, engagements at a certain level. Um, investors these days are, you know, early stages is broad, right? And, and so we're, we're, we're seeing probably what you think we're seeing too in terms of categories. And I, I, we've talked about this earlier, you know, ad tech, ed tech, health tech, cybersecurity. Clearly in my mind, like the big pillars of, of this, this area and there's stuff that goes beyond that. But, you know, it's, it's all about sort of, because everyone's like, what stage do you have to be at to get capital? You know what I mean? And it's like, n really not like, you got to be beyond the prototype stage. You, you got to have some traction. Unless you're somebody who's done it a few times over. And we've done, we've done deals with people like, you know, James Foster from Zero Fox, who's done it three times. And this product wasn't built when we funded him, you know? Um, and about other people who are really bright, first time entrepreneurs come in, great idea, unproven track record, probably go out, kick the, you know, kick the tires a little bit, let's see some traction, let's see some validation that, that what you actually have is something that's viable, and then you know, um, we potentially will fund you. And we've also seen people that have come and pitched us back in the day before we actually had more like our guidelines of, you know, are, are, your, t are your terms reasonable, you know, is your valuation reasonable? You know, we always, we always pretty much always invest on a convertible note. Uh, so we're actually um, doing debt at first that converts into equity so that we don't have to worry about what's the valuation of your company, um, that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts to it, but those are the things like from, from an entrepreneur's perspective, like, you know, have your problem, have your solution, which is your product, or your, you know, ideally your product. We don't really fund service-based businesses, um, and and show that it's out there in the market and that it's been validated. And the more of that, the better. Um, and then there's also the, the there's also the um, uh, route of syndication too. Like if you talk to the Baltimore Angels, you should be talking to the Dingman Center Angels, and you should also be talking to the Next Gen Angels, and you should also be talking to K Street and potentially the New York Angels, right? Because then when we get sort of and Tedco. Tedco, by the way, is um, a great resource uh, in Maryland. If, if you guys don't know about Tedco, it's a great place to, to get in. They're part of our group for a reason. Um, they have this great TCF program. You know, they'll give you X amount of dollars if, based on milestones. And so that's a way to like show the angel community that you've checked off a bunch of different boxes and have hit milestones and have kind of gone down that validation and proof of concept. and and then they share their due diligence with us and then we do our own due diligence and it's a much smoother, kind of quicker process. Um, no, that's good. Um, you had mentioned that there's four specific areas, I think you said four, um, in terms of ad tech, ed tech, uh, cybersecurity and healthcare. Uh, do you see or what, what do you kind of predict in terms of what's gonna happen in the future in those specific sectors? Are, are, is any one of them gonna take off or you know, what, what kind of growth do you see? Well, I think, I think cyber's taken off. Um, we're definitely, I think, the epicenter of cyber, um, at least on the East Coast. There's so many, there's a lot of cyber activity here. UMBC is doing great stuff with cyber. Um, you know, I would say arguably, you know, arguably risk, uh, Zero Fox is, is making big ways. Um, as an investor in that company, um, the team is executing at an amazing level. Again, there's that, you know, three, four times uh, entrepreneur. Um, and so cyber's just between, you know, the, the, the proximity to the government as well as the commercialization of, um, you know, sort of, sort of consumer cybersecurity. Um, there's, a lot of there's a lot of good stuff happening there. I almost said bubble, but I didn't. Um, ed tech, just we're in the epicenter of so many ed tech companies around here. We just got, there's a big ecosystem. Ad tech, if you think about it, the whole region, which I don't understand, doesn't really think about this as an ad tech company, but if anyone read the BBJ, or ad, ad tech region, the BBJ did a great article about the fallout from the Ferber brothers, you know? John and Scott Ferber started advertising.com, they, they scaled the crap out of it, they sold it for a half billion dollars to AOL for cash, and then all those people who, you know, did that, who were entrepreneurs and took that ride with them, went out and started companies, you know? Stack is the most recent one. James Curran and Mike Sabelsky co-founded that, and uh, that's, that's solving a really big problem in, in ad advertising technology. You have Lodemy, um, you have, uh, 
gosh, I'm, I'm pulling a blank on, on some of these. Name, name, what am I missing? Uh, yeah. Millennial Media, Videology, um, they're all here. They're all right here. Largest mobile ad network, biggest, one of the biggest video ad, ad networks, um, um, a data service provider um, that, that, that um, helps analyze uh, different um, uh, advertising audiences, which is low to me, doing some really cool stuff over there. Stack takes like all of the advertising operation and ad technology platforms that typically a media buyer or a publisher needs to log into what I heard on average you know, 15 different applications to look at their reporting, move their budgets and stuff like that. They're basically like an operating system on top of that and integrate all that kind of stuff together. So there's some really cool innovation happening. Um, I think that the ad tech stuff is going to keep going because I think already millennials starting to shed off a next generation of entrepreneurs. Videology is definitely going to, you know, keep this whole sort of ripple effect of exited entrepreneurs, you know, build a big company, scale a big company, sell a big company or go public, and it sheds off the next generation of entrepreneurs who have that domain expertise and say, and find different problems in their industry and start companies, right? And then there's the capital there to, to fund them. And you're seeing that with ed tech, um, ed tech too. So that actually brings up a, a, an awesome topic that, uh, that I think Greg is pretty, uh, pretty knowledgeable on in terms of uh, the life cycle of uh, how ecosystems are sustained yeah. within a tech hub. And this is, um, you know, this, this is a little known fact about Greg, but um, you know, we all know that he does a lot of stuff, right? He does a lot of stuff in terms of startups and you know, building up the tech community, building up startups, uh, and just helping and giving back, right? Um, but there's a, there's a fundamental principle that we don't understand about Greg unless you've listened to uh, some of his talks or some of his speeches in terms of, you know, his fundamental ideas on why that's so important. Uh, we had a conversation earlier in terms of, and this is the same conversation I had with uh, Bobby Ocampo at the last event, is, uh, you know, why, why is it that uh, the East Coast cities are um, not as developed, you know, should I say, in terms of uh, tech hubs as opposed to you know, your West Coast counterparts or even Northeastern ones. Um, and I'll let Greg take over uh, you know, this, this kind of topic that we're talking about in terms of what his fundamentals are um, for why or how a tech hub becomes sustainable. Sure. And the part that you guys play. Well, yeah, so um, it's really simple. Uh, you know, and, and I've talked about this a lot and, and I've written about it a lot. And basically, it's a very simple concept. And I, kind of just what I just said about like the advertising.com example. So in order to build a really thriving, sustainable ecosystem, you know, it's my opinion that entrepreneurs who start companies, scale companies, and sell companies have an exit in whatever format that comes in, um, that instead of just even going right on to the next company or moving out of the region or leaving, um, they turn around and they spend time giving back to the community and filling holes in the ecosystem. And I tried to do that um, when I sold Blue Sky. You know, I had an in, a really interesting um, scenario that, again, sort of like the bootstrapping thing. Um, after when I was when I sold my company, they allowed me to leave the company like the day I sold the company, which was very bizarre. But I found myself immediately with like not without a job after 10 years. And so um, I had this thought, and, and I was like, well, I could, you know, I traveled a little bit and hung out with my family and all that kind of stuff, but, you know, entrepreneurs, their thumbs will start spinning real quick, you know? And so I was like, well, if I was going to do this all over again, what, was, what wasn't here that I think could be here to be resourceful to the next generation of entrepreneurs? That's why I took over the Angel Group, spent time organizing that, getting that going, proud of that work. We're still rocking and rolling these days, and we got a lot more to go. And then, you know, my co-founders at Betamore and I were all sort of thinking around the same thing. Like there was accelerators popping up in other cities. There was co-working, which is still relatively new in town. But you know, there was the Beehive at the ETC, um, and and we, we we found we just thought there was need, there was a need for like more of a space that did community development, co-working, incubation of companies, and more and most importantly to us, education and teaching and, and, and everything from entrepreneurial skills to finance skills to front end web development to back end web development and really kind of put in this you know layer of professional development, workforce development and 
also having a, um, a, an area or, or, or a campus that tied was tied to local institutions like UMBC and Hopkins and UB to pull the students out of those institutions and get them connected to the ecosystem so that we had talent retention versus talent export, which has been a real popular thing here in town, where you come, you get educated, and then you get the hell out of town and go to New York or go to Austin or whatever. And so I felt very passionate about the fact that, you know, in order to build this ecosystem, entrepreneurs who have done that turn around, give back to the community, you know, put things in place that will help the next generation of entrepreneurs, and then go back to doing what they do which is build companies, create jobs, create opportunities, create wealth. That's, and then that's what I call the cycle of entrepreneurship. Awesome, and yeah. I want to see more people do that here in town. So, so that means that if uh, any company. of you guys uh, create a successful company, uh, according to Greg, you, know, you should definitely sell it. Make sure that you give right back to the community. If you ever see me on the side of the road and I'm down on my luck, uh, don't forget. I'm hireable, I think. <laughs> but I think, you know, it, and it's, not, you know, it's one of these things where it just doesn't happen overnight, and I realize that, because it's not like this is an everyday occurrence, but like, you know, if more people do it, you know, and also if like, you know, the overall ecosystem lets the entrepreneurs kind of lead it, there's a concept of leaders and feeders that, you guys know who Brad Feld is? You know, his whole idea about building these systems, ecosystems, is like, let the, let, let, you know, there's leaders and feeders, and let the leaders be the entrepreneurs, not the government, not the institutions, not the foundations, not any, let the people who start, build, and scale companies be the ones that, to build the ecosystem. And then you got, and then the other ones I mentioned are the feeder system to it. Yeah, yeah. what Greg's talking about there is uh, kind of what California does in practice in terms of you know, better than most other places, uh, the leaders and feeders. Right. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the government kind of takes a backseat, and, you know, your Googles, your Facebooks, uh, the, the, the big guys who've created huge companies and a lot of wealth in the area give right back and then, you know, lead that next generation. Um, yep. You know, going on to the next subject, I mean, you know, what's, uh, what's, what's, what's a good piece, piece of advice that you would give? Um, you know, we, we talked about in terms of uh, setting up for, for funding for a startup, but just in terms of, you know, just... Being an entrepreneur? Yeah, being an entrepreneur, you know. I, I you know, there, there's a lot of advice I could give, but like an overarching one is, is this whole concept of like believing in yourself and, you know, if you're really going through, a, 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 you know, if you're really starting a company and you're, you're an entrepreneur, there are, I, I don't know if maybe I just read this today or something like that, but it resonated with me. Like, there are literally days where you just want to go, like, I mean, look, I'm running a startup now, Mission Techs, you know, we're, we're, we're seven people. I've had days already that I've wanted to, like, stick my head in the sand and, like, not come out because it's just, you know, you have rough days, product developments, so, like, there's just good days and bad days. But, like, I think that what's really served me best is this overarching attitude of glass is half full and I'm an eternal optimist, and I think the best entrepreneurs out there can maintain some level of those two things, this positive attitude and the true belief that anything is possible, and the true belief that you can do, that you can do it, you know? Like that? Yeah, I think you have um, a, uh, someone who agrees with you in the and audience. And so, you know, because and, and I, I, I've spent enough time around negative people, I've hired plenty of negative people, I've fired negative people, you know, and, and I, there's a dynamic that changes when you start like thinking about energy and, and what you spend your time around it. And so I think like, you know, and that's what we're doing right now at Mission Ticks. I mean, we got a great crew. Like the, the energy is like starting to like turn in the, I mean, 13 year old company, right? I come in like out of the blue, like look at this guy, you know what I mean? Like I inherit a staff, I inherit, you know, like the whole thing. And uh, it's been this process of like, you know, I got a great team. And the energy is just changing because we're, we're, we're trying to be positive and now people are starting to see like, wow, we could actually become a big company. We could actually be a market leader or a market innovator or a market disruptor or, you know, and oh, this is maybe the way we could do it, you know, versus, you know, when I got there, there's a few people who were just like glass half empty, not gonna happen, you know, and, and uh, they've kind of cycled themselves out of the business, which is which is good. As for as for because uh, like you, negative people can't hang out, positive people too much. Yeah, they're horrible. <laughs> <laughs> as for uh, mission ticks, uh, you know, 
you just became CEO, what, like two weeks ago? I think I literally I've actually been CEO since, since um, I was a consult. I was consult a lot of people know I was there, but I was, I was a consultant last year, and I became CEO in January. In January? Okay. But we just announced it You guys recently. announced it recently. Okay, because I think I tweeted you and said congratulations that same day. But um, You did, thanks. <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, Mission Tech, I, I, I did a lot of research on them. Uh, like you said, awesome company. Uh, one of uh, you know Baltimore's kind of founding staying companies. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any big big goals or big plans in mind, or is that anything you could share yeah, in terms I mean, of what you plan to do with it? Yeah, I mean, I just want to build another great company with great people and a great product, and I want to go into an industry. This is very reminds me very much of the Blue Sky days. I mean, it really does. I mean, how many ticketing companies do you know? I mean, probably not as many as I know now, but let me just tell you, there are a lot of them. Okay, between Eventbrite and Ticket Leap and Ticket Fly and Ticket Biscuit and you know Ticket this and Ticket that and you know it's we go right back to the same old question, right? Well, what makes you different than anybody else in the market? Why should I sell my tickets on Mission Ticks versus you know whatever? And so there's obviously like the big 800-pound gorilla at the top, you know Ticketmaster, and some of their related companies, and then at the bottom of the pyramid you have like the event brights, which are like the constant contacts and email. And then the, you have this mid-market sort of section, which is the area that I sort of like to play in. And so those are like not bake sales, you know, but like, you know, the All Good Music Festival or, you know, the shindig that we're doing in the Cowell Park or, you know, Brew at the Zoo, Wine at the Woods, uh, Maryland State Fair, like all those types of events where, you know, it's more of a service layer with a great product. But like ticketing is ticketing, right? And so typically the ticketing provider's job ends when you redeem the ticket. So I walk up to the gate, of course everything's going mobile, no doubt about that. You know, you scan your ticket, our job is done, right? And so we're thinking about it fundamentally from an innovation standpoint. Like, well, could we make the ticket redemption just the beginning of the experience when the consumer gets in there? Like what, what else can we do? So yeah, we have big plans. We're gonna do a whole in-event experience platform. We're gonna create a cashless commerce platform. Maybe, maybe some people have seen that. If we're lucky, we'll launch it at the state fair this year so you don't have to buy those damn rip tickets for the carnival rides for your kids. All be on your phone and, or, or a band like you know a, a wristband. Um, and my expertise is marketing. So um, my background's marketing. And so the real kind of juice of a ticketing provider that really is gonna deliver the, que the answer to that question is because I use mission tickets because I sell way more tickets when I put my events on sale with them, right? And beyond the relationship stuff and all that kind of stuff and account management. So we're really looking, um, we're working hard on, on, on building out an ad network that we've developed using email, using mobile, using social, using display, using search, using all the awesome ad technology from this region that's been built. Um, and playing around with a whole bunch of different, different ticketing models for, for, uh, from sliding ticketing service fees to potentially going in on the risk with our clients um, on their events and having a sliding scale on those performance-based ticketing fee. Um, we are also, so there's a lot of stuff that, I mean, I can keep talking about it forever, but we're trying to change the way, like, you know, if anyone was gonna define the tickets as a service pl play, we wanna be that company that defines the ticket as a service play which we're defining what that is. But ticketing in general um, is pretty nascent, and so we're looking at innovating and disrupting the space a little bit. Okay, okay. And then uh, my final question before I open up to uh, a little bit of Q&A is, uh, you know, what's, what's in the future for Greg? What's, uh, I mean, you know, this, this doesn't even have to be a business-related question. What's, you know, what's, what's the direction that you're headed in? What are some upcoming well, cool things? I know, uh, so Greg uh, just became a, uh, an uncle today. Uh, he, uh, an hour actually, ago. About a, yeah, about an hour ago, so he, uh, he got a text message. Um, actually, yeah, and actually and, uh, uh, six we, we, we've been keeping uh, We've been keeping up on uh, making sure everything's going good, and he's probably getting 100 text messages, uh, keeping I've turned up to date my phone on off. stuff. Yeah. Uh, but family, yeah, I mean, what, what do you have going on? Um, yeah, so, I mean, um, you know, right now it's, it, it's, it's, it's tough right now because I've got all these things going on, you know, Betamore's going on and the Baltimore Angels is going on and Mission Ticks is going on and there's only so much of me that I could, you know, like I think we talked about, like getting stretched too thin. So first off is 
you know, I've got great people, by the way, going back to that people thing. And I, you know, Sean McElroy runs the Baltimore Angels for us. Mike Brenner and Allie run Betamore. And we've got some other people that are, that are helping us there. So right now, I'm shifting all my attention to mission, mission techs because that's the right thing to do, right? And so from there, um, I want to build a great company again and learn from all of the lessons that I learned running Blue Sky and applying them to mission techs. And it's great because we, you know, we, we're just like this really core, small group of people right now. I think you know, seven with the interns. And, and, and so now we're kind of hitting the reboot button and getting ready to launch our new product, getting ready to create a whole bunch of innovative products that are coming on top of our platform, like the ones I just mentioned. And we're going to go to market and start beating the drum really loud. Um, so that's, that's first and foremost. And you know, I. I I don't know really where it's going to go. It's really, you know, it really is more, it's about the journey, you know what I mean, and then the destination. And, uh, and it was like for Blue Sky, I mean, we didn't really have any intentions of selling the company or being acquired, just opportunity came at the right time. It turned out to be the right time. And, you know, if that happens with Mission Ticks, maybe it does. Maybe I'll turn around and, and, and start and, and, and try to become a, an entrepreneur who actually goes out and raises the capital and runs the company with, with outside capital. Um, I don't think I want to do that though. Um, I do like I do like the bootstrap model. Um, it's not for everybody. You can't move as fast. That kind of stuff. So we're, we're always constantly weighing those pros and cons. Um, but want to build a great company. Uh, want to continue support Baltimore. Want to make sure all the initiatives that um, um, I'm doing in, in town are sustainable. Because nothing. It doesn't matter if like the Baltimore Angels goes away. If Betamore closes. If you know, there's no early stage financing. It just, it would suck to have that happen, right? So I really am focused on sustainability um, because I can't, I can't spend all my time doing all those things anymore. Um, and then, you know, I'm a loving dad and a loving husband, so I like to spend a lot of time with my family and I love to travel. And for anybody who knows me, you know that I am like the biggest live music fan in the world to the point where I think I've blown my ears out officially because I have to wear earplugs now. I just got them made, custom earplugs. Um, too many nights, um, too many shows, too many concerts. It's not really, it doesn't bode in well with my, my concert, but my, my current role. But, but you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna just, I wanna see Baltimore kind of be known as this innovation hotbed of, of technology. And, and so I'm going to keep working and doing my part to keep that going. Um, and try to bring, I'm actually really involved in also trying to bring other companies here and not big companies like startups. Like why, why move here? Well, you know, it's, it's awesome. I hate to say the live, work and play thing, but Baltimore's got so many cool little nooks and crannies and we've got this bubbling ecosystem. Um, we want to expand Betamore. I mean, we have a campus now in Federal Hill. You know, there's a possibility we might have another campus somewhere else in the city in the future. There might be a possibility we might have two or three in the future. You know, so we want to. I want to keep growing these things and and making sure that all aspects of the Baltimore community, from youth all the way up, are are served by some of these things, so that um, some of these programs, so that they're educated, aware, know what the resources are, and know that if they want to take the jump into entrepreneurship or find a job or get mentored, there's these there's these resources here that are clearly um, in easily findable and um, you know approachable. Awesome. All right. Um, now we're going to take a couple questions. So uh, if you guys have any questions, just raise your hand. And I'll uh, man, make me all walk all the way to the back. All right. First question. Uncle Greggy. What's up? I was uh, recently at an ACA summit, the Angel. Oh, yeah, in DC. Yeah. And the theme of that whole conference was the jockey or the horse. I'm just wondering where you stand on. Is it the entrepreneur or the product that you're selling? It's the jockey. As, as a as a angel investment. It's the jockey. One hundred percent. I mean, I I I have I, I it's written on my blog. I would rather invest, you know, in an A team with a B idea than a B team with an A idea. You know, it's just it's about the people. It's about execution. One hundred percent. All right, we got another question over here. Greg, you spoke eloquently about the virtue of being positive, optimistic, going forward against all adversity. And I've never met a successful entrepreneur who didn't have that skill. At the same time, there's a complementary skill, which is 
reading the signs that say you got to pivot, what you're doing yes. is not right. Tell me how you balance those that that yin and yang. Yeah, you don't want to keep you know spinning your wheels and doing the same thing over and over again and not getting the results that you're looking for or the traction that you're looking for. So there is a moment in time where you know. I sort of look at that, so how I kind of balance that is just like, even when I can't find the way and it's not evident to me, and it's happened many times, because I definitely am the far from like the guy who has got all the answers, it's just that belief of like, okay, patience and focus, right? And, 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 and knowing that, you know, and it's wild because every time I do that, and we've done this at Mission. I mean, they've only been here a couple months. We've done this a couple times. We've, we've pivoted some ideas around just based on, hey, we're going to go do this, right? And some of the stuff I talked about, the way we thought we were going to go there turned out to be complete and total dead ends, waste of time, not going anywhere, needle not moving, right? But like, but it's still a good idea. Is it still a good idea? Let's go talk to some of our clients, ask validation. Yes, it's still a good idea. Okay, keep going. Just don't be, be relentless on you know trying to move the needle going down an idea and then all of a sudden another way would appear or a new partner would, would show up or so that's the sort of like the optimism piece that always keeps going in my mind but I you know I, I sometimes I just don't know which way we're gonna go I asked to tell this story that um, I ran Blue Sky Factory 100% off my gut feel I mean people are like elaborate business plans da -da -da -da, all that kind of stuff I, I know it sounds crazy I know it does but like I really did I ran, I ran it all about, from the people I hired to the deals that we did, all the way down to selling the company. It was just like, if it was meant to be, it was gonna be, but I always stayed glass half, on, glass half full and, and had a positive outlook. And so that's a rub though. I'm glad you brought that up because you, know, you can get dissuaded if something's not, not happening and you can think that you're making the wrong decisions. And, and sometimes you could be making the right, wrong decisions. I just think overarching, glass half full positive attitude kind of just keeps you going you know if you get dragged down on the mud which I do sometimes too it just keeps me it pulls me right back up it's always bottom line also really good to have good smart people and positive people around you awesome we got a question up uh, up front real quick hey, Greg. Matthew so, um, HD scores thank you this guy's bringing transparency to all of the kitchens in America thank you uh, so basically, uh, the question relates to focus. There are so many good ideas, there's so many good features, there's so many good functions that you can you know, do in whatever you're going to do. Yep. Um, or as an entrepreneur in a system, uh, what is a good tip or good tips for, I guess, focus related to entrepreneurship in? Product development? Or what? In bottom. Focus. Just, just, just focus. How I guess how is the best way to I guess keep that focus or focus here or have entrepreneurs focus here? You mean in the city? Sure. You mean like getting people to come here or just focusing on their Fo their products, their their businesses? Yes, the second. Well, I mean, if you're an entrepreneur and you're not focused on your business, you know, first and foremost, focus on your business. Um, yeah, you know, you know, maybe you're talking about like priority and prioritization is what like I kind of like was reading what you were saying, and like you know what to do first, and like I'm I'm product guy, so I'm thinking I'm thinking from the product lens, like what what do we put in the product? Like, you know, at Blue Sky, Doug knows this, and we had just like tons of shit we put in the product, like feature after one one year we. One year we went on, those of you who are software developers, we did, we did agile development for one year. So we had our tech team doing one, one month sprints where, you know, and we didn't have a CTO at Blue Sky. It was like pretty much me and the dev team, um, which was crazy, but they, they worked with it. And it was like whiteboard session, cool feature, cool feature, this integration, that integration, blah, 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 blah. Two weeks of development sign, one week of test, launch, right? Boom, next month started all over again. And like, we got this big bloated product and then like we started looking at the usage and it was like, everybody was using like 10%. Like, it, it's all about like, what's gonna, what's gonna be valuable to the, the, the end user or the customer? Like, like with your business, you know what I mean? Like HD scores, like you probably have a whole bunch of good features, a whole bunch of things that you wanna do, 
but what is like the value to the customer? What is the value to the end user, right? And so that's where that whole like iterative process of software development and product development comes from. It's just, it's agile development. It's just like launch it. Like right now, I'll give you an example because I'm getting ready to do it. Like we are caught up in too many features in what we want mission ticks to be right now. Like there's so much stuff we want to do. And we've been, we're two months past the, the, like, the launch, you know what I mean? It's just it's common too, this happens all the time. So instead of being negative and getting down on the developers, it's like, okay, let's strip this thing down to a minimal viable product to launch, right? What do we need to run the business? We stripped it down, right? Friday at 10 a.m., I'm getting the login to the next push, the next code, right? This is happening real time. And then we're going to take this huge set of, of features that we have and, and, and just start to plug in the ones that we know the clients. And we're going to, it's all about talking to your clients too. There's this thing about developing in a vacuum. You've heard of this, heard of this statement? It's like, I'm going to go build the greatest product in the world that I think everyone's going to use. And they go away and you develop it. And like you come out and people are using, that it either doesn't resonate with them because they weren't involved in the process. So for me, so for prioritization and focus, um, at the entrepreneurial level and at the company level is really kind of understanding what makes the clients happy, what makes the product good, um, and having a strategy for continuing to improve it. There's this, like the saying, like, just ship it, right? So that's where we're at. We're just going to ship it at Mission Ticks and then iterate. Cool. Uh, I was, uh, as Greg mentioned, the COO. I worked with him many years. He is a real deal. I'm telling you, this guy is a real deal. Um, we're lucky to have you in Baltimore, but um, you know it, it's interesting. Um, my job was basically to execute the vision, and I remember Greg uh, whiteboarding, you know, maybe five years ago. Here's what the ESP market, the email service provider market, is going to look like in five years. And this is what we're going to build to, and it's where all the marketing automation companies are now: Exact Target and Marketo and Infusionsoft, and these other companies that you see. So. Um, one thing that you know was I, I certainly appreciated working at, at Blue Sky Factory was that the company. And this is important. The company was not run by spreadsheets. I mean, it was. I, I walk in Greg's office. He wouldn't have 12 spreadsheets out and figure out a way to cut your cut your company. You know, cut to the growth uh, trend, and that's not what we did. We we um, and I certainly learned this from Greg. Was the focus was on the customer. What does the customer want? What's the customer need? And then the second half of that was just as important, which um, you spoke about briefly, and that is you know, believing in the team, hiring the right people, and, and having that combination of an engaged um, CEO and an entrepreneur who is focused on you know, the vision of where the market's going, what, what problem is going to be solved, having the right team to do it, and, and certainly um, you know, keeping your eye on the customers was, was huge. So um, it, it, it certainly worked. It was awesome, man. I mean, it was a seriously awesome. You were an team. awesome guy to work with, I'm telling you. I mean, we, we built this, like, client service team, you know, um, that was, so, going back to Matt's question, I mean, it was so, rig I mean, like, so rigorously focused on, like, when you got, when you became a client of our company, like, this transition from sales to account management was so not bait and switch. It was, like, so smooth. Like, you'd get a handwritten note from your account manager. Welcome to Blue Sky Factory. I'm looking forward to working with you. You know, Elena. You know, like, I mean, just the clients loved us because the touch point was so high. And, you know, literally, we had people who were paying constant contact 50 bucks a month, right? 50 bucks a month to do their email marketing, who would pay us 500 bucks a month for the same <laughs> service just because they liked the people so much and, like, the, t the high touch was there. So that was, that was cool. Awesome. We got another question back here. You talk about bootstrapping, and yeah. uh, I mean, I've done it myself for the last two years with my business, and I've come to the point where I've determined I can continue bootstrapping or I could go after funding. At what point would you determine a company should transfer from bootstrapping to actually receiving funding? At the point at which um, you think you can go out and like totally kill a market, you know, and dominate a market, and, and like you believe in yourself and you believe in your product and you think that you are the kind of person that can handle, you know, a board, you know, uh, making tough decisions. Uh, I'm not saying that that doesn't come with not with bootstrapping. I'm just saying that like 
people raise capital to, 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 to like jump and prounce on an, a market opportunity and, and ideally to hopefully win that market. And there was a good piece that I think Frank Bonzel shared on Facebook just yesterday um, about you know bootstrapping or raising capital, choose wisely. You should read that post because um, it, it really does summarize that if you're this kind of entrepreneur, then you should raise capital. If you're that kind of person, you should bootstrap, right? And so, and there's a lot of really good examples in there. If you're like, if you're not getting anywhere with your, your company because it, you, you know it's, it's capital intensive and in order to go out and execute quickly to gain market share, you should probably go out and raise capital. Um, but, but be able to do it in a timely and efficient manner and don't let like the opportunity pass by. Um, in our case at Blue Sky, we just kept reinvesting in the business and we were an exact target or you know silver pop or you know name your flavor of email service provider. We were just a nice, you know, national, you know, 100% sort of boutique ESP that, that did what they did really damn well and their clients loved them, you know? And we were happy with that. Like, I didn't want to go out and build, a, I don't need to build, I didn't want to build like saying like singles and doubles are okay. Like not everything has to be a grand slam, right? You know, so getting in your mind where you want to be, like I'm a singles and doubles, maybe uh, this could be a triple, I don't know. but like. It's okay. I don't need. To, I don't need to be a billion. You know, a billion dollar company. You know, I don't really have any interest in building a billion dollar company. If it, if this thing took off to be a billion dollar company, that'd be great. But I'm totally content if it was like a thirty or a fifty million dollar company, which for me is like the next thing. But I mean, I want to do it without raising capital. I know I could do it a lot faster, but I think there's enough runway in the market um, based on the fragmentation that I see that the innovation and the stuff that we're doing. Um, we'll plug in. So at the like for right now, I don't think I'm going to go out and raise capital. Um, and so just it really depends on what you want to do. You know what I mean? If you want to be the market leader, you better go out and raise capital. You know what I mean? We want to be a leader. We don't need to be the market leader. You know? All right. We could take uh, a couple more questions. We're we're running out of time sure. here, so I'm going to grab uh, this gentleman. Greg is going to stay around for a little bit. He gave me his word uh, to mingle for for a little while after the event as well. I know he can't stay forever, but um, I, I don't go, get to. I got to go meet my nephew. Yeah, yeah. So if I don't uh, if I don't get to uh, everyone's question, you know, please feel free to uh, exchange information or just shoot him an email as well. All right. Uncle Greg, um, <laughs> so you said you value the jockey. You'd rather take the A jockey versus the B product. Most of us are B, C, D jockeys. What can we do? What are specific things we can do to get to that A I'm, jockey position? Do you have the A product? Mm -hmm. All right, let's say, let's say we have the A product, but we're like B, C, we're like we're yeah, 20 so year old kids. That's okay. 22, 23, you know, I we mean, have no traction. As you that's okay. What can we do? Show, show, show the market and when I say the market, depending on who you're looking like, if, if it's investors per se, show the investors that, like, there's plenty of people that have gotten funded that are the big question mark is, are they, you know, the jo are they an A or a B jockey, right? And so show through traction that your product is good and then you've been able to execute it. Like, I'll tell you a company, like, there's a company called Reify Health. Has anyone heard of them? I mean, these are all Hopkins students that dropped out, right? They are killing it. Like they are going to build a billion dollar company. Never any of them have ever done it before. Now, it just so happens that, and obviously I'm biased because they were like the second company to move into Betamore when we opened it. And I watched them work well before we got involved with them. Actually not really well, only maybe for a month before we funded them, like the angel group funded them. Um, but they did this amazing pilot where they went out and they said, we're gonna build this technology and we're going to help you know streamline you know clinical trials and, and healthcare. And in the first three months of them, they that not only did they do that, but they also found out that there was a whole other application for their business outside of healthcare in education. And then spun out another company called Signalvine, and hired a CEO for it who was an awesome, awesome CEO. And spun that out, and then kept iterating on their product and are now like, you know, unfortunately they left Baltimore, which is a whole different thing. They're in Boston now, um, but they're killing it. I mean, they've got, I mean, never, never been there. But so for us, it was, it was their pilot that they had this idea. They all dropped out of school to pursue this dream. They built technology and they went for it and they totally validated it. 
Does that mean they're A jockeys? I don't know, but it, it, made, it was enough to make everybody in the room feel comfortable that putting money behind these guys was a good idea. And since then, we've seen them just kill it. Unfortunately, they left Baltimore. All right, guys, uh, that's uh, about it in terms of questions. Fast. Like I said, Greg's going to be around, but um, you know, let's, uh, let's all uh, thank Greg for being here. It was an awesome, uh, awesome guest. Um, thank you.